الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومعلمنا وعظيمنا وحبيبنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جزيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين We are continuing to tackle the subject of understanding and misunderstanding of Islam Last time we covered the issue of the allegation made that Islam like any other religion has nothing to do with political issues, governance, or the rule of the people. And we brought a whole set of ayat from the Quran that address this issue. That is, who should be ruling, what guidance should be followed, and who has right to rule, how could he be uh, elected or selected, <coughs> excuse me. And Today, we are going to tackle the same subject, Islam and governance, as it relates to the issue of war and peace. I will just give today a glimpse into the subject from one incident in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, but we will cover this issue independently from and away from the surah we are addressing today, which is Surah Al-Fatih, Surah number 48. Surah Al-Fatih came down as the Prophet ﷺ was given a vision in his dream. Six years into the migration uh, to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ had already gone through a lot of fights uh, and has weathered a lot of attacks on Islam and Muslims from uh, the battle of Uhud all the way through the battle of Al-Ahzab and so on and so forth. And throughout these battles, Muslims were doing nothing but pushing back, defending themselves. And this is something that should really draw our attention, that a fight in Islam is not so, supposed to be a fight of aggression, a fight for expansion, or a fight for resources, whether it is oil or water or anything else. A fight which will be destroying lives, most probably destroying properties, should not be done for selfish reasons. It has to be done for legitimate reasons. But this is a subject for another time. The Surah of uh, Al-Fatih came uh, on the heels of uh, the uh, exclusion of and deportation of uh, several Jewish tribes who have violated their agreement with the Prophet ﷺ. And inshallah, soon we will be presenting you with the agreement and what it means to our subject. I want you to continue to remember and keep focusing on the subject. The theme that we are addressing those issues under is does Islam have a say in governance? And in this surah, we will see how much it means. Surah Al-Fatih is a surah that came, as I mentioned, as a way of a vision to the Prophet ﷺ, or after a vision that came to the Prophet ﷺ, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina that you are given clear victory against who? Against his enemies, the pagans of Mecca. But the, the vision itself is talking about 
how it will happen. The vision, لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤِيَا بِالْحَقِّ Allah has realized the vision of his prophet in truth. لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ آمِنِينَ You will most certainly enter the holy mosque in Mecca safe and secure. آمِنِين مُحَلِّقِينَ رُؤُوسَكُمْ وَمُقَصِّرِينَ some of you will have shaved their heads. Some of you will have just got a haircut. محلقين رؤوسكم ومقصرين لا تخافون without fear. Can you imagine Muslims who are very few in contrast to the community in Mecca coming back to Mecca in force and entering Mecca peacefully. Nobody is scratched. No fight. آمنين then لا تخافون the significance of the term لا تخافون is recognized when you see how the children of Israel were so scared when they were ordered to enter the city of Jerusalem and Musa told them Allah is ordering you to enter they said no we can't what happened they were too scared of the inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem to dare come close or enter. Until in the discussion they tell Musa, اذهب أنت وربك فقاتلا Musa, you and your Lord go and fight. إنها هنا قاعدون We are sitting down here. This is what fear does. So it is significant that Allah is telling the Prophet in his vision, in his night dream, that they will enter Mecca without fear and they will be safe. This is a security assurance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's go to the surah. Indeed, you have been given, we have given you, O Muhammad, a clear conquest. This is the opening of the surah. The surah itself comes down on the heels of what is known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took about 1400 of his companions from Medina to Mecca to make Umrah, which everybody in Arabia does. So as a community, they went to make Umrah. On his way, when he got close to Mecca, they heard that the, uh, the pagans of Mecca have gathered their army and they are going to fight them and stop them from entering into Mecca. This is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Qurashite, but his tribe stood against him. Like many tribes in the Arab world today are going against their people, the Prophet's tribe stood against him. So looking for peace and avoidance of conflict, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam changed path. So he chose a route to Mecca that is different from where they are standing for him. They got the news and they went to face him in the new place. And when they got there, the Prophet ﷺ was faced by the delegate representative of the pagans, Amr, Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr, as a leader in the pagan community, told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, what do you want to do? Quraysh is, is determined that you are not going to enter Mecca. So negotiations went on back and forth, and they ended up agreeing to the treaty that is known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah was based on the conditions of the pagans not the conditions of the Prophet. And when they started to dictate it, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started to dictate Ali ibn Abi Talib to write down, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. So Hayal ibn Amr would say, I don't believe that. So erase it, remove it. The Prophet tells Imam Ali, remove it Ali. And he replaced it with another statement saying, Bismillah al Wahid al Ahad, remove it. So they went back and forth 
until the Prophet ﷺ agreed to remove it. And he said it verbally and told Ali, don't try it. And then he went to say, this is a written agreement from Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Suhail ibn Amr. He said, Suhail said, if we agree that you are Rasulullah, we wouldn't stop you, so remove it. So he told Imam Ali, remove it, Ali. Ali refused in a rare opportunity or a rare event that he would say no to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he refused. He felt it's too ominous to give up this for the mushriks no matter what. But at the minute that the Prophet Sallallahu was in this situation with Imam Ali, his nephew and the husband, his son-in-law, he told Imam Ali, show it to me where it is and I will remove it. And then he wrote from Muhammad ibn Abdullah to Suhail ibn Amr. So he removed the word Rasulullah. I am going into these details to let you into the real picture. The real picture is a conflict of wills and a conflict of determination. And the pagans relying on their power and the army was standing by. Khalid ibn al-Walid was still not a Muslim yet and he was on the other side. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted to avoid a military conflict at any expense. So he was willing to remove from the writing what is written in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a lesson for us. Those of us who are following the conflict today between the Islamic movements against oppression and tyranny in our world that we do not judge how they maneuver, what tactics they use until we are clear as to what the end negotiation or push and pushback will end up being. In the case of the Prophet وسلم, Allah sent down the surah telling him, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. Indeed, we have given you, O Muhammad, a clear conquest. So that Allah may forgive for you what preceded of your sins and what will follow and complete his favor upon you and guide you to a straight path. This is what Allah told the Prophet وسلم, that Mecca will be defeated and they will come back and they will enter and they will be safe as he told him in his dream, in his vision. So the Prophet وسلم, accepted in the treaty theoretically and practically unacceptable conditions. What does he rely on? He relies on this promise. So the Prophet knows what is going on between him and Allah and the promise and the companions are not really aware how could this treaty be called a fath, a clear conquest? How could it be when the conditions are so uh, bad and unjust? So among the conditions, they said that if any pagan accepts Islam and goes to join the Prophet and his community, Sallallahu the community, the Muslim community, will have to return that person back to the pagans. But if a Muslim upstated and went back to become a pagan again and left his religion, the pagans don't have to return him back. And who wants somebody like this back anyway? So the second part of the condition was not the bad one, but the bad one that affected the companions a lot was the condition that they would have to send back a person who's coming to accept faith and join the community. How could you send him back to people who would and have been persecuting Muslims for years? More than 19 years of persecution. So much so that some of the Muslims who were too poor to migrate and too weak to stand out, they continued to be believers, but they hid and concealed their faith and stayed in Mecca. They couldn't go to Abyssinia, they couldn't even go to Medina, so they stayed there and they hid their faith. They were not able to move. So 
when the Prophet ﷺ accepted this kind of condition, the Sahaba were really very, very upset. So much so that uh, Umar ibn Khattab would go to Abu Bakr and ask him, Abu Bakr, isn't he the messenger of Allah? And Abu Bakr's eyebrows were raised. He said, of course he is. Then he asked him, aren't we the believers? Aren't we reliable enough that he can trust us? We will defend him, we'll defend our community. He said, of course we are the believers, Omar. What are you asking about? Then he comes with the third question asking, why do we accept such a treaty? It is too humiliating in our faith and it's too humiliating for us in the Arab culture you do not withdraw from a fight. When you are threatened, you stand up. Dead or alive, you stand up. But in this condition, the agreement was, what was in return of those conditions? That the Prophet ﷺ would come and the community would come the following year and he would enter Mecca peacefully. He would enter Mecca peacefully. So the Prophet ﷺ, in return for this, he was willing to accept that this year would go peacefully. They don't have to make Umrah and they could come the following year. So Umrah ibn Khattab finished with Abu Bakr and he went to ask the same questions to the Prophet ﷺ. What did Abu Bakr answer him? Abu Bakr, who is called the Siddiq, the truthful and devout, committed, obedient follower of Allah, and follower of the Prophet ﷺ, he told them, Umar, follow his path. Ilzam Gharza. Wherever he walks, you walk behind him. That is a commitment. This is discipline. This is obedience. And this is what distinguished Abu Bakr all along. He never said no to the Prophet ﷺ. And he never hesitated to follow anything the Prophet says or does. He always questioned others who challenged the Prophet, but he never questioned the Prophet ﷺ and he never hesitated. And the Prophet ﷺ records this for him. He says, مَا نَصَرَنِي أَحَدٌ بِمَالِهِ وَنَفْسِهِ وَأَيَّدَنِي مِثْلَ مَا فَعَلَ أَبُو بَكْرِ Nobody has ever paid as much and supported me as much financially and physically as Abu Bakr has done. So the discussion goes and the Prophet ﷺ tells Umar, Umar, I am the messenger of Allah and Allah told me this will turn into a great conquest. He would never let me down. Does this make Umar or any of the other companions even easy on the issue? No, it wouldn't make it easy for them. So they continued to boil and refuse internally because it's too humiliating for them. And the Arabs always calculate the consequences. They don't look for the moment. Not the Arabs of today, but the Arabs in those days. They would always calculate, if we give up today, then what guarantee is that they will not do the same next year? So they always calculate ahead of time. And this was the reason they were resentful. And the resentment actually was very much into the issue of, aren't we believers enough to trust us that we can stand, we can fight. As the negotiation was going on, uh, the son of Suhail ibn Amr, the pagan negotiator, came by to announce his Islam to the Prophet <laughs> To add fuel to the fire, he comes. So he became the first test of this treaty with the Prophet <laughs> live to his commitment or would he cave in to the pressure of the companions and say, I cannot let him go back. No, the Prophet lived up to his commitment. And he told uh, Suhail the son, go back and Allah will give you an exit and an easy way out of this. So he goes and he doesn't go back to the pagans, but he goes out of the Muslim community and he goes to take a coastline area as his refuge, part in the desert. And he stays there. Following that, 
comes another one. Following that comes another one. Anyone coming, the Prophet ﷺ would send him back to uh, Abu al-Janid, or I don't recall his name. So he told him, go back and join him. So none of the new Muslims who are coming to join the Prophet would be uh, accepted in the community. They would be accepted, but they would be told not to stay in so that they don't cause a violation and a premature war. In the following year, the Prophet ﷺ uh, comes to Mecca, and part of the treaty was that two tribes were, one of them announced their affiliation with each side. Khuza' announced their affiliation with the Prophet ﷺ, and another tribe by the name of Bakr, they affiliated themselves and came under the protection of the pagans so that if something happens between any of these communities, then the other side will come to defend their protectors. So uh, the pagans attacked Khuza'a, and Khuza'a, of course, called for the Prophet's support. And in two years, the Prophet ﷺ came back opening Mecca. Why are we going through this whole story? Just to say a few things, number one, why does the Quran give text to something so political? It's war and peace. And why does the Prophet ﷺ, as a prophet, a spiritual leader supposedly, right? As we classify people today, you are a spiritual and the other guy is businessman, the other guy is a politician, so on and so forth. But the Prophet ﷺ was a spiritual leader, a political leader. And he was also an army leader. When it was fights, the Prophet ﷺ would be inside the battlefield, not remotely controlling what happens. So uh, the life of the Prophet ﷺ is a clear example as to what is the role of the Muslim in this life. Can you separate your life into political and religious and spiritual? and business and family or are you one person with one personality with one reference for guidance and you are following this guidance wherever you are and that's why you see the quran the quran does not does not separate between the uh, the Quran does not separate you or split you into several personalities. You are one person. And your title that Allah chose for you is to call you a Muslim. He has called you Muslims from before. Before creation, uh, before the time the ayah was sent down. But your name with Allah is a Muslim. What is a Muslim? A Muslim is a person who submits to Allah, whether he talks, whether Allah talks about political issue or governance issue or birth of a baby or marriage or divorce or family issue or educational issue or anything else. The Quran, wherever it has guidance, the Muslim cannot reject it, ignore it or overlook it because he cannot say, I'm a spiritual person, I will not follow that part. So the purpose of going through this surah is to show first the background of how political, it is an issue about war and peace, it's an issue of politics. Who's going to control access to Mecca? What are the conditions? Why does the Prophet lead the negotiation? Couldn't he have said, Abu Bakr, lead the negotiation? Or Omar, you lead the negotiation. You know these guys. But no, he led the negotiation. And he stood for his community. This is what a leader should be doing on behalf of his community. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, ayah number three. And Allah may aid you with a mighty victory. You will get a very powerful victory. What is victory? Victory is an issue of peace and war, right? You will win. You and your community will win 
That's Allah talking. This are what we read in the Quran in Ramadan and in other times and say, we love the Quran. This is the Quran you love. The Quran you love is talking about governance, talking about the Muslim community taking charge of it is fate, it is responsibility in self-defense, not relegate this to somebody else. And every Muslim in the community should stand like the Prophet Sallallahu Then it says, it is he who sent down tranquility into the hearts of the believers, that they would be increased in faith along with their current level of faith. And to Allah belong the soldiers of the heavens and the earth, and ever is Allah knowing and wise. What is this about? The companions, when they were going back to Mecca in the year of conquest, they were coming not 1,400, but they were 10,000. They were 10,000. How were they assured of what's going to happen? They were assured by listening to these ayat. These are the ayat that they were listening. And Allah is reminding us that it is He who put peace and comfort and security in the hearts of the believers so that their faith in Allah increases upon the level of faith they already have. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only is telling the Prophet to lead this political and war peace battle, but he himself is engaging the community. He is taking side with the believers. He's standing with them. Why? Because they trusted Allah. Something happened at the side of Medina when the Prophet ﷺ told the community in Medina, we are going to go to Mecca. The Bedouin Arabs, they are always a puzzle. They are always a puzzle. So some of them, they stood behind and said, no, we are too busy. We have families and we have business. Which means we are unable to join you, O Muhammad, because we have families. As if 10,000 people joining the Prophet didn't have families or didn't have business. And the ayat will uncover what they were concealing in their heart. They thought that Muhammad and his community will go, they will be finished, and they will stay behind, and they will be re-embraced by the remnant of the Jewish community in Mecca, in Medina, and they will be re-embraced by the victorious pagan community in Quraysh. One may wonder, why did they say they were Muslims anyway? <laughs> They said they were Muslims because throughout the fights between the Muslim community and its enemies, Muslims were constantly winning. And hypocrites can only flourish when the environment has two sides. So they always want to hold the balance from the middle. They want to secure your love and support, and they want to secure their protection. So they stand always in the middle. So they take the side secretly of the disbelievers, but publicly they proclaim they are Muslims and they even join the prayer, they pay uh, sadaqah and so on and so forth. But the Quran describes them as, وَإِذَا قَامُوا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ قَامُوا كُسَالًا When they join the prayer, they come reluctantly, which means they only come so that they are not seen as non-Muslims or known to be hypocrites. So they just join for the sake of joining. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues the promise. <coughs> and that he may admit the believing men and the believing women to gardens beneath which rivers flow to abide therein eternally and remove from, their, from them their misdeeds. And ever is that in the sight of Allah a great attainment. This is a great win. This is a great win from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest win is not the victory you get in this life. It's a win. But the greater victory is to qualify to enter into paradise. That qualification, that entry is the greatest win of your entire life. And what will happen 
to those hypocrites, men and women, and that he may punish the hypocrite men and hypocrite women, and the polytheist men and polytheist women, those who assume about Allah an assumption of evil nature. Upon them is a misfortune and evil nature. And Allah has become angry with them and has cursed them and prepared for them hell. And evil it is as a destination. What an evil destination hell is. May Allah protect us from hellfire. So as the Quran secures the position for the believers, men and women, the Quran announces the destiny and the fate of the hypocrites. This is something that has to be clear. When you see people supporting evil, that is clear evil, and you see people inclining to support it, whether it is out of fear or out of uh, seeking benefits from the tyranny and the oppressive regimes, you have to understand that they fall somewhere. So here the Quran is, is dividing the community into nothing but two groups. You have the believers, men and women, and you have the hypocrites, period, period. And the enemies, the outside enemies, the pagans and the kuffar and the mushrikeen, they can only weaken the resolve of the community from within by making them listen to the hypocrites. Very important. The more we listen to hypocrites, the less resolve we have. Then we start caving in. We start saying, yeah, akhi, this is going nowhere. Uh, until when are you going to keep standing? You are wasting your effort and time. But the mere fact that as communities we stand for truth, that is all what is needed, just to stand for truth. This is what is required. You don't have to do anything else. Stand for truth and stand for justice. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to assure the Muslims, He tells us, and to Allah belong the soldiers of heavens and earth, and ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. What is the importance of this? Because Muslims will come at times to become less in number, less equipped, weaker in overall assessment of their power, and they needed this assurance that Allah has soldiers beyond what they already have. But you cannot ignore mustering as much power as you can and say, Allah will give us victory if he wants to. No, you have to do your part. This is a principle that we Muslims have to believe in. And that again plays into the issue of is Islam a religion of just spirituality and personal relationship with Allah? Or is it a community faith in which the community, the society, the nation as a whole is required to put together as much power as they can to deter the enemies of Allah, to prevent aggression and to prevent unnecessary bloodshed? Is this not political? Is this not national security for the community and the nation? It is. Why is the Quran talking about it? Because it's part of your faith. Then Allah tells the Prophet وسلم, and us so that we follow him, indeed we have sent you as a witness and a giver of glad tiding and a warner. We've sent you as a witness. Witness over who? His community. So that the Messenger وسلم, will become a witness over you, either for you or against you. So we have to be careful. When we do anything, we have to remember the Prophet could have been with us. What would we have done if the Prophet were with us? Would we have let up? Would we have given up? Or would we have stood with him? Or would we act like the hypocrites over excuses upon excuses and ignore the responsibility even of self-defense? <coughs> so he is a witness and he is a glad tiding giver. He gives good news. He gives good news. 
And it's very important that you know that if you stand up and you are killed in the path of Allah, you die as a martyr, shaheed. And no one, not George Bush, the son or the father or the brother or anyone else should be willing or able to tell us who is a martyr and who is a murderer. If you stand for truth and justice, to push back in defense of your nation, of your community, and if you get killed, you are a murderer. This is what the Quran says. The, the source of our knowledge and judgment and guidance is the Quran, not a politician anywhere. We should listen only to Allah. We should only respond to Allah. And Allah says, وَمَنْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْتِهِ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ يُدْرِكْهُ الْمَوْتِ فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَلَئِنْ قُتِلْتُمْ وَلَئِنْ مُتْتُمْ أَوْ قُتِلْتُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ لَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَحْمَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ If you are killed in the path of Allah, in defense of your nation, your community, and you are killed, your reward is secure with Allah. So no one can take this away from us, who is a murderer and who is not. But what are the conditions? So that you people may believe in Allah and in his messenger and honor him and respect the prophet and exalt Allah morning and afternoon. An amazing condition. Believe in Allah as if the ayah is saying, not following the Prophet means you're not believing in Allah. Not standing for your community and nation's defense means you don't believe in Allah because you're violating his clear orders. And then, and to support him, to support the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Support him in what? Imagine if 10,000 people told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what the children of Israel had told him when he was going to Mecca. The children of Israel told Musa, you and your God go fight. We are waiting here. Imagine what turn of history would this have meant for the entire Muslim community and the Muslim faith if they let him down. So to azziruh means you stand as men, take his back and support him because his back is your back. And supporting him is your future. If you want to have a better future, stand with the Prophet Sallallahu Tawqir is the highest level of respect and recognition. To recognize his leadership and to defer to his leadership. So even if he decides something that is not very tasteful in your mouth, or not very convenient or comfortable to your heart, follow him. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ وَتُسَبِّحُوهُ To praise Allah and to rush and swim and keep fast forward towards Allah. تُسَبِّحُ الله. To praise Allah and to be constantly flying towards him or swimming fast towards him. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the people who stood up with the Prophet وسلم, and gave him the pledge, the pledge of tu'azziru wa tuwaqiru, the pledge of commitment. Indeed, those who pledge allegiance to you, O Muhammad, they are actually pledging allegiance to Allah. What an elevation. What an elevation. Then it goes further. The hand of Allah is over their hands as if they are shaking the hands of Allah. When it says the hand of Allah is over their hands, it means Allah is blessing what they are doing. So he who breaks his word only breaks it to the detriment of himself. And he who fulfills that which he has promised Allah Allah will give him a great reward. So you have to always ask yourself those questions. What do you actually want? The reward of having a family and spending time with the family and going after your business and ignoring your security? 
Does this make sense? It doesn't make sense. Or else, do you want the pleasure of this life and you want to ignore and neglect the fate that you have to face in the hereafter? That also doesn't make sense. A very short life is not worth it, right? To waste the eternal life. So you have to put this in your calculus as you make a decision. Then the story of the Bedouin, Arab, Bedouin Arabs who refused to join the Prophet ﷺ for fear of their money and family. Not real fear, but it is an excuse because everybody has families. Those who remain behind of the Bedouins will say to you, our properties and our families occupied us. They took us away. So ask forgiveness for us. They are telling the Prophet after he came back, please forgive us. Forgive us, we couldn't join you. Our family needed us. Our business would have been ruined if we had left. So please ask Allah to forgive us. So they know they were sinful, but they want to get away with it. They want to get away with it. They say with their tongues what is not within their hearts. And this is something amazing, that Allah is telling us what is in their hearts so that we know that if I speak, Allah knows how truthful or how lying I am. Uh, say, O Muhammad, then who could prevent Allah at all if he indeed intended for you harm or intended for you benefit? Rather, ever is Allah with what you do. He is all acquainted with all things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, whether or not you believe yourself, Allah knows that you are lying. And Allah knows your secret, and he knows what you say in public and the difference between the two. So why do people fall short of their own faith? It is either that they are trying to avoid harm or seek and secure benefit. So you see here the ayat are talking about if he wants benefit or harm for you. These are the issues. These are the issues that go into the calculations. So if I want to excuse myself of responsibility, I create excuses, flimsy as they may be, but I create them and then I keep repeating them until I believe myself. You see, the media process is relying on two things. Your consistent listening to what they say and their power to keep drilling in your head and heart the fear they want to implant in your heart. That's all what it is. So the more you listen to them, the weaker you become. You become the weak link in the community and in your society and nation. So Allah will uncover here what is going on in their heart. But you thought that the messenger and the believers would never return to their families. That's what you thought. Ever and that was made least pleasing in your hearts and you assumed an assumption of evil and became a people ruined. You ruined yourself by assuming the Prophet, he has very few people. They are going to Mecca and the people in Mecca, they have fortresses and they have been there, they have fought him several times. But this time, they are not coming to Medina. Muhammad is going to Mecca. And as such, he is more likely to fail. When you travel for uh, 400 kilometers away, uh, down south from Medina to Mecca, definitely you're tired, you're exhausted, your resources are less than when you started, and you are not likely to be with the same power and energy. So they said, by the time they get there, they're going to be even fewer. Some of them will die on the way. And those who outlive the trip, they will not outlive and survive the battle itself. So they assumed, they assumed the evil that Allah would let down the Muslims. They assumed that the power of the pagans is greater. Therefore, by sheer number, they will win. Which means their whole calculus is away from the rules of the game. The rules of the game is, you stand with Allah, Allah will give you support. That's a rule. And who 
whosoever has not believed in Allah and his messenger, then indeed we have prepared for the disbelievers a blazing fire. This is a very serious threat that now the ayat are not talking about the hypocrites as just the hypocrites. Now it's labeling them as disbelievers. This is, this is very serious. So if you stand in the middle, there is a threat. If you don't take side with Allah and his messenger, you all are subject to that threat. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. He forgives whom he wills and punishes whom he wills. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. Allah will forgive. They ask the Prophet to seek Allah's forgiveness for them. Allah saying, it's up to Allah. Not even the Prophet will intervene in this because the fight is now between Allah and these people, the hypocrites and the disbelievers. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us clear vision and clear understanding of our deen and clear strength in our heart to stand for truth and fear none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ameen. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمد عبده ورسوله وبعد Brothers and sisters uh, You might have heard it, you might not uh, We are collecting blankets for the refugees uh, in many Muslim lands especially in Palestine and Syria Those refugees are living in the open air in this cold winter and they are relying on you to fulfill your pledge of being a Muslim, of being their brother. And we need to understand that our role is not a favor that we just play unto them. It is a responsibility. Imagine if you don't have the heat in your home for three, four nights. What would you do to cover your children? Just imagine it and ask yourself, does it move your conscience? We are only going to collect up until tonight at Isha. So please, if you could buy 10 blankets, don't buy nine. If you could buy 20, don't buy 19. Take it seriously because those people are really in urgent need, emergency need. And keep in mind the fact that all the neighboring countries are crying foul that the pledges made by other nations to support and finance the refugee accommodation, they have not fulfilled their pledges. So now that the governments are not fulfilling their responsibility, are we as people, as individuals, and as a community going to follow the government lead, give minimum or give nothing, or are we gonna follow our heart and our faith? I hope that we follow our heart and our faith. Inshallah, next, uh, next week I will not be in, but you will have a guest, Khatib. But the following week we will continue with the rest of Surah Al Fatih because it still has lessons that we have not covered yet. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, wa afina fi man afayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma aksim lana min khashiyatika ma tahulu bi baynana wa bayna maasiyatik, wa min taatika ma tuballighuna bihi jannatak. ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين اللهم اجعلنا للحق واقفين واجعلنا للعدل عاملين واجعلنا للسلام من العاملين اللهم ألف بين قلوبنا اللهم ألف بين قلوبنا 
اللهم انصر الاسلام واعز المسلمين واعلي بفضلك يا رب كلمتي الحق والدين واجعلنا هداة مهتدين غير ضالين ولا مضلين واختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة